good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, really my pleasure to welcome you to, to this uh, fourth lecture of the cycle of conferences given by Professor Kolmanowski within the framework of the Cher Jomot. Uh, just to have uh, a fast recap of uh, where we have been in the recent past, the, during the, this chair that started on the 1st of May, we had first uh, a two days workshop uh, with uh, uh, some of the most uh, prolific authors in the field of uh, nonlinear and constraint control uh, uh, in this area of Europe. Uh, this uh, event was organized by me and by Professor Kolmanowski and was uh, considered by everybody a very nice success. And then after that, we had this cycle of four lectures uh, here in the Ecuri of the Royal Academy. The first one was uh, concerning, uh, actually the first two lectures concerned mostly the automotive industry, while the last two were mostly on aerospace. In particular, the last one was on space, and today it's about flexible aircraft. So a, sh a short uh, introduction about our speaker. Uh, so Professor Kolmanowski is a professor at the University of Michigan at Ar Ann Arbor in the Department of Aerospace Engineering. So in his career, he started his research career in the very same department where he contributed to a series of uh, fundamental uh, discoveries for what concerns uh, uh, constraint control in particular. After that, uh, he uh, left academia for about 15 years working in Ford Motors for around, for as I said, around 15 years where he kept he kept doing his theoretical research on the side, but was mostly involved in very applied research. Uh, some of his things, uh, some of the things that he produced uh, ended up uh, also in production. And after that time, he came back uh, to the University of Michigan as a, a full professor since, and since 2010, he is a professor there. Uh, so his interests... Uh, uh, are mostly in the field of constrained and nonlinear control with a particular emphasis uh, to applications uh, that are, as you can well imagine, in the world of automotive uh, and aerospace. And uh, I was very happy to invite him here in Brussels, and then I was very happy that he could get this chair because uh, I think his, his curriculum, it's very interesting of what an engineer should do, that he is... Uh, being able to conjugate uh, a very good fundamental research uh, with real and practical problems. So uh, I'll, uh, I could go on uh, saying the various uh, prizes, uh, scientific productions that he had, number of patents that are more than 100, but I, I will not continue like that. Otherwise, uh, uh, I will embarrass him probably too much. So I am uh, really happy to introduce him. And uh, please, uh, Ilya, come. And, uh, introduction, Professor Garoni. It's a real pleasure and honor to be, uh, to be here. Uh, and today I'd like to speak about uh, uh, flexible aircraft and some of the control uh, challenges uh, from perspective of uh, someone whose primary expertise and interests are in control, but then looking at this class of uh, uh, very interesting problems related to aircraft. Uh, before I begin, I would like to mention that uh, what I'm going to present uh, is very much realized as a part of collaboration uh, with uh, Professor Carlos Cesnik in our department, uh, as well as a number of colleagues uh, looking at different aspects of uh, flexible aircraft from uh, uh, issues of uh, modeling uh, to air elasticity to, uh, uh, to uh, design optimization and finally to control. And uh, Matthias Pereira, um, is a PhD student who was uh, co-advised by Professor Cesnik and myself. And many of the things I'm going to say I have learned from uh, either Professor Cesnik or uh, Dr. Pereira. Um, so uh, first, uh, uh, an introductory uh, remark uh, in terms of importance of control uh, for modern and uh, future aircraft. And uh, it's not surprising that uh, there is an increasing reliance on control as control and software as an enabling uh, technology. And uh, some of the uh, 
future aircraft, uh, they tend to be more difficult to control because you would like them to do more interesting, uh, interesting things. Uh, and that creates opportunities uh, for applications of solutions uh, based on advances in, uh, in control theory. And this is a diagram that I uh, took from a presentation by Diana Acosta from NASA, which suggests that as uh, uh, one of the trends in uh, aircraft design is uh, uh, more and more relaxed stability, and so implying that there is a more and more reliance on uh, control. And today I'd like to speak about uh, uh, this type of uh, considerations for uh, flexible as well as very flexible aircraft and what differentiates flexible, increasingly flexible, and very flexible aircraft is a degree of flexibility. Uh, if you fly an aircraft, it's of course not perfectly rigid. Uh, if you look at the wing, it would uh, vibrate, right? It would uh, show some deflections. Uh, but uh, rigid body and elastic responses can be largely decoupled. You can define what uh, role pitch and yaw are uh, for, such, uh, for such an aircraft. And most of commercial airliners, uh, they, they uh, fall into this uh, category. However, uh, if you think about future airliners, as well as various other interesting aerial uh, platforms, in particular high-altitude, long-endurance aircraft, uh, they tend to have drastically higher extent of the flexibility. And I'll mention momentarily why this is the case. Uh, and this creates a number of uh, interesting uh, considerations in terms of flight dynamics of such aircraft and number of challenges uh, for a control. But essentially, air elastic response is coupled with rigid body response and flight dynamics, uh, flight dynamics uh, mode. So the traditional decoupling uh, no longer works to the same extent, and that makes these uh, problems uh, both challenging from a uh, modeling perspective and control perspective, but also it's an opportunity to do something uh, that is interesting and exciting. Now, um, if you look at uh, the, the, the pictures of some of the flexible aircraft, you notice that they have longer, slender wings, or what's called the higher aspect ratio uh, wings, and why this, this happens? Well, if you think about uh, uh, some of the approaches to reducing fuel consumption of, uh, of aircraft, um, which is an important uh, priority, you know, there is a several um, things that you can do, certainly lighter weight, lower drag fuselage. You could look at various uh, solutions on the propulsion side, perhaps hybrid gas electric propulsion. But one of the nice opportunities is to increase the aspect ratio of uh, the wing. And the reason for that is because uh, the, uh, this, this reduces the drag that, uh, that uh, aircraft uh, incurs, and therefore it uh, uh, reduces uh, fuel consumption and decreases uh, the, um, um, the fuel burn. In fact, this is a, a chart that I, uh, um, I borrowed from... Uh, Another colleague in our department, Professor Martins, who works extensively on the multidiscipline design optimization of aircraft. And so uh, he, he looks at the ways of, for example, designing an airframe, uh, looking at trade-off uh, in the fuel burn, uh, also looking at um, uh, takeoff uh, weight characteristics and how to optimize the shape of that, that wing. Um, and uh, as you can see from his results, if you look at aspect ratio and high aspect ratio corresponds to longer, longer wings, uh, then uh, the fuel burn uh, tends to uh, decrease uh, no matter which, uh, which uh, technology you, you use for the, for, for, for the wing. Uh, and so um, uh, this, this is very, very helpful in that, in that, in that regard. Um, and so you could think about... Uh, sort of this chart as you progress from uh, uh, current uh, airliners, which, which would be flexible, a uh, higher wing aspect ratio, lower drag, lower fuel consumption. But then there is a number of challenges uh, with the increased flexibility that we are going to talk about. Um, and this, is, this concerns high deflections of, uh, of, uh, of the wings um, and uh, various other very interesting issues. 
Uh, now, uh, I mentioned one application for very flexible aircraft as a high altitude, long uh, endurance platform. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, well, you can uh, make such an aircraft solar powered. Uh, you could put it up perhaps uh, uh, about uh, uh, 20, uh, 20 kilometers in terms of the altitude. Uh, and it can stay up uh, because of it's been very efficient. It can stay up there for, for weeks at a time because it's probably unpiloted uh, at that point. Um, and uh, you can use it for imaging. You can use it for communications. Pretty much you can use it for multiple purposes that you can use conventional satellites for. And so in that regard, it's a very uh, promising uh, technology. I think on the picture here, you have a Zephyr, Airbus Zephyr uh, aircraft. Um, and it could be a potential repla replacement for satellites. Uh, of course, if you manage to fly it uh, in uh, with, with these wings and uh, uh, keep it keep it keep it in flight, which is a challenge in uh, dynamics and control. Uh, this is another uh, uh, sky dweller. Uh, it's a company that uh, operates uh, um, a similar aircraft out of uh, Spain, and they have been on uh, on a news uh, in building. Uh, interesting looking aircraft for various missions. Uh, Google, uh, Facebook, and others are looking at uh, fairly interesting uh, aircraft uh, configuration. And I think there is something flying here, but this is not part of my presentation. <laughs> it's, uh... um, anyway, University of Michigan also has uh, a very flexible aircraft called uh, XX scale. Uh, and you could see here on the picture, so you get a kind of a sense of its uh, size. Uh, and uh, uh, this is actually a picture taken during one of the test uh, flights. I think this is uh, Professor Sesnik, uh, and who who uh, who built this aircraft uh, along with his collaborators. I think I'm here also in the picture, the third uh, from the right. Uh, and then there is a number of uh, very talented students and uh, postdocs. Uh, uh, and uh, this is uh, actually the test pilot. It's no longer a student. Uh, so, uh, and then if you look at uh, uh, what this aircraft can do, so it has uh, propellers, which are driven uh, by uh, electric uh, motors. Uh, you have uh, elevators. Uh, you also have uh, right and uh, left uh, uh, roll uh, spoilers. So uh, there's quite a few... Uh, uh, actuation uh, degrees of freedom. Uh, now, what was the purpose of developing this aircraft? Uh, it's certainly very flexible. It was designed uh, to collect experimental air elastic data, so it was a primary means uh, to validate some of the air elastic models that uh, that are being developed. And you need you need data right, to, to be able to validate the models. But it's also something that uh, is very useful in terms of being able to evaluate uh, control, uh, control strategies in, in flight. And so here's a video that was, uh, I think, taken on the same uh, day uh, that shows this aircraft in flight. Uh, and I think that the thing to notice is that you could imagine that it has fairly interesting dynamics uh, as, it, uh, as it flies. Uh, its shape changes quite a bit. Uh, so it's now it's it's uh, going to to land. Uh, this aircraft is piloted by by a person, but there is a control running on board because it's a stability. There is a stability augmentation system. You wouldn't be able to fly it without some form of stability augmentation. Uh, but but uh, uh, but it is it is uh, there, there is a there is a, a gentleman in a photo that I showed was was piloting um, that that aircraft. Now, uh, as a controls person, uh, if you look at uh, this type of aircraft, what do you see some of the uh, challenges? So first, uh, this idea, reduced separation and increased interactions between rigid body and flexible modes. Uh, this aircraft really doesn't behave as so, sort of a rigid reference plus uh, some small deviations from that rigid reference. It's really, uh, it's really quite uh, quite flexible. Of course, you can define a body fit frame for such an aircraft, and and, and you do in the modeling, but uh, it experiences larger uh, deviations. And you could imagine that uh, 
as it changes its shape, if you look at aerodynamic forces and moments, uh, they, they change as well as structural forces and moments within the structure. They also, uh, they also can vary quite, uh, quite significantly. So it's, it's a very interesting problem uh, to play with. So complex nonlinear dynamic behavior, including large deformations and aeroelastic uh, effects. Um, you can actually model uh, such, such aircraft. There is, um, there is a way to, to model them. Uh, based on physics, but the models that you end up with um, uh, tend to be high, high, high order. So you you typically end up with something like a thousand of states. Uh, if you think about the level of differential equations, you end up with something uh, that has a thousand states. Of course, if uh, you are a controls engineer dealing with thousand states, anything that has thousand states is a very significant uh, uh, challenge. Um, these aircraft have multiple control effectors. Uh, by control effectors, we mean various aerodynamic surfaces for, for, for control, as well as uh, propulsors right, that, that are on board on the craft. And then uh, there is uh, numerous structural and control effector constraints. All the actuators have limited range, but then also you would like to maintain uh, the internal forces and moments, the loads within the aircraft structure, within the limits to preserve uh, the structural integrity of that of that aircraft, so it's a um, hopefully uh, uh, interesting and challenging uh, challenging problem. Uh, and in fact, uh, that has been understood uh, in in uh, in flight uh, experiments. Uh, this is a Helios aircraft uh, by Aero Environment, uh, and um, uh, it had an interesting uh, uh, sort of uh, mishap where. Um, uh, what happened is that it was flying, uh, and then I, it was hit by a gust and went into high dihedral configuration, so high angle. At that point, it started to develop interesting dynamics that uh, ended up to be unstable, uh, and unfortunately, it uh, it uh, it crashed. Uh, and if you look at uh, if you model this aircraft and uh, look at, for example, eigenvalues corresponding to fugoid mode, one of the basic flight dynamic modes. Of aircraft, as this dihedral changes, for example, you add a payload here in the middle, you could see that depending on the payload, you could start being stable and then uh, you, you end up with, uh, with an unstable uh, fugoid mode. This is just a manifestation of some of the challenges in, in, in dealing with this problem. Uh, now, another way to uh, think about uh, whether controlling more flexible aircraft is more difficult is to look at some of the tools in, in control. In particular, we have ways of calculating uh, things like controllability index. And controllability index basically characterizes control costs to bring aircraft states to uh, trim uh, values. So you have a perturbation and uh, you're asking uh, how much control effort would it uh, take to bring you back to, to the trim, uh, trim value. Uh, and uh, this question is answered by computing controllability gramian, which, which you can do based on a, on a linearized uh, model. Uh, and so uh, what you can do is sort of uh, in the modeling uh, tools that uh, Professor Cezan has, uh, we can uh, play with uh, stiffness of the aircraft. Uh, and so there was a family of aircraft with increasing stiffness that was created, starting from original exhale uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to a stiffer variance. And then we compute this controllability gramian, which is characterized by the minimum eigenvalue of, uh, of the controllability gramian, normalized by the nominal, uh, nominal one. And so if you look at stiffness multiplication factor, so this is stiffer aircraft. This way to the left is, uh, is uh, more flexible. And you look at this controllability index, uh, you see controllability index increases with stiffness factor, which does confirm that as the level of aircraft flexibility increases, it becomes more and more difficult to control. Uh, now, uh, so changing configuration of the aircraft creates some interesting flight dynamics, but it's also a problem that if you have very excessive loads, then the structure can actually disintegrate in, in flight, right? The aircraft can break. Um, I don't have a, a picture of that for uh, X, uh, X scale, uh, but there was, uh, for example, uh, an aircraft uh, 
that was uh, uh, involved in fire suppression mission, and as it was performing aggressive maneuvering, uh, the loads exceeded critical loads, and the structure has, has disintegrated. So the other challenge is to be able to make sure that uh, the loads are kept within um, safe limits, so you, this this uh, um, aircraft is able to, to to fly. And of course, this type of issues are even more significant for um, more flexible aircraft. Okay, so uh, in terms of the, um, I was I was trying to um, anyway. I hope this movie plays. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, so constraint control for low elevation, increasingly flexible aircraft. So as in general, um, much of the stock is going to be about low elevation systems. And the idea of low elevation systems is to coordinate control effectors in such a way as to reduce loads, keep loads within a safe range, and preserve structural uh, integrity. Uh, and uh, load elevation uh, can be achieved by controlling aircraft control effectors, uh, such as uh, ailerons. And if you look at the typical wing, uh, I don't think I will be able to play this movie, but it's called Vals of the Ailerons. You could see uh, the ailerons are doing uh, some very sophisticated motions, and you sort of realize that uh, you can do quite a bit of things with them. A simple idea, how you elevate a load on aircraft structure, um, if you think about pressure distribution over the wing, so this is aerodynamic loading, what you can do is to concentrate is more uh, inboard, and this will uh, reduce the bending moment, right? So this is so you go from this picture, this distribution where you have larger moment arm to basically smaller moment arm, and this will um, reduce uh, reduce uh, reduce the moment. Uh, this just suggests that by by shaping the wing, you are able to. Uh, to do uh, load elevation. Uh, now, uh, there are two types of uh, systems. Uh, one of them is maneuver load elevation, which uh, elevates loads during the maneuvers. And from control perspective, I tend to view uh, it as a constraint trajectory tracking. Um, and for most of my talk, I'll actually going to talk about this. Uh, and then uh, if you encounter gust, uh, there is a gust load elevation system, uh, which is more of a constraint disturbance rejection. I will speak a little bit about gust uh, load elevation uh, as well uh, during my, my presentation. Uh, but certainly aircraft with uh, uh, long slender wings is more likely to fail when uh, encountering gusts or performing maneuvers. And that's why these are important issues. Now, uh, when you start looking at this problem, you realize that uh, uh, the, um, um, this type of problems really are cross-disciplinary and uh, they belong to an area of control of aeroelastic systems. And you have to look at them from multiple, multiple angles. Uh, in control, we are concerned with the design implementation of control algorithms uh, that, in a broader sense, link sensor measurements to actions. And we can think about actions as being control effector settings in aircraft in this, in this case. And then aeroelasticity has to do more with providing models for control, but also models for validation. And it studies the motion induced by interactions between inertial elastic and aerodynamic forces occurring while an elastic body of an aircraft is exposed to fluid flow. Now, uh, when initially I was introduced to this problem, I, I was very excited because I, I saw an opportunity to use uh, something that... Uh, I know a little bit about, and uh, Professor Garoni is an uh, expert uh, on, uh, and uh, his group uh, does extensive work on, which is called Reference Governor. And the Reference Governor, it's an add-on scheme to a nominal control law. So you have a nominal closed-loop system with your normal flight control uh, uh, system. And then what uh, you do is that if you have a certain constraints, for example, constraints on uh, angle of attack or on uh, uh, loads within the structure, uh, you put an extra device here. This is really an algorithm. And what it's going to do is that when the maneuver is too aggressive, it's going to modify this maneuver in a minimum possible way to ensure that the constraints are satisfied. So you go from uh, uh, original uh, command, which is R, to modified command V for, for the maneuver. This could, for example, be flight pass angle command to the aircraft. 
And you make sure that the maneuver becomes a bit less aggressive and you satisfy constraints. You might also have some disturbances acting on, uh, on, um, on, on the system. Uh, so this is something that uh, uh, both Professor Garoni and myself have been uh, working on quite a bit in the past. Um, how is this reference governor designed? Uh, well, the modification of the reference is based on determining uh, using so-called safe set characterization whether a command has a potential to induce constraint violation. And I'll sketch uh, uh, simply the idea. It turns out that you can look, if you have a model uh, of the system, ideally a linear model, but could also be nonlinear, you could uh, characterize the set of all the states and constant commands which do not result in violating the constraints uh, over some infinite time uh, horizon. Turns out that such objects can be computed or approximated. And if you know that uh, that, uh, that uh, a set, um, then the basic idea is that you tl- try to make this uh, output V as close as possible to R that you want, subject to modified command being saved that is in this, uh, in this uh, set or infinity, which is a safe set. So there's quite a bit of theory around schemes like this. And uh, Professor Garoni, uh, one of our colleagues, Stefano Di Caran and myself, we have a survey paper that uh, talks about various ways how you can uh, design the schemes. And so um, when I realized that actually reference governors can be helpful, I decided, well, let's take a look at something uh, simple first, just to understand how this uh, might, uh, uh, might work. Uh, and I looked at a single rotational degree of freedom plus a single elastic degree of freedom model. So theta here is the angle of rotation of this base. Uh, Q is essentially model coordinate. There is a single uh, mode, and these two subsystems are coupled, and you apply the torque to the base of this, uh, uh, to this rotating base, pretty much. So it's fairly easy to, 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 to specify. Um, I am assuming that I have a command for my... Uh, uh, theta, which is the uh, orientation of this base, and I'm using proportional plus derivative controller to, to control it. So my torque is uh, given by this equation here, where everything is, uh, is, is, is known. And now I have constraints. Uh, I have constraints on orientation angle. Then I want to keep deflection small. So I'm constraining my um, uh, model coordinate to be less than or equal than 0.01. And then the torque... Uh, my actuators are also limited, so I have a constraint on torque. And now suppose I apply some kind of step commands, fairly aggressive maneuvers to the base. So I'm asking to change orientation quite aggressively. Uh, and as you can see, the controller is able to follow this orientation change. It's, uh, it's slightly damped, but I made it so on purpose. It's more aggressive. But now if you look at the, my model coordinate, the deflection of this appendage, you could see that I'm violating my constraints, which are shown by this uh, dashed, uh, dashed red lines. And so, and also my uh, uh, torque uh, or my actuation limits are also violated here. So, so clearly you, you see that uh, this is a too aggressive a maneuver and there is a problem. Uh, so with a reference governor, you can uh, make the maneuver less, less aggressive. Uh, what you do is that... Uh, for small steps, uh, pretty much there is no modification. You can perform this maneuver without violating constraints. But for larger one, it replaces it by uh, a ramp, um, and it uh, slows it down just enough so you touch uh, the constraint boundary, but you never exceed exceed the constraint boundary here. So that's pretty much how how this this works, and it also works for uh, simultaneously for uh, torque uh, torque limits. Uh, now, uh, of course, this was a made-up example, and often uh, as a researcher, when I face a practical problem, I first like to create a simple example that might have some features of a, of a, of a true application and play with it, and once I learn enough, maybe attempt something more complex. Uh, and so if you were interested to play with such a, such, a, such a problem without a model that has thousands of states, it turns out that you can look at a, a multi-body aircraft uh, model which consists of three pieces, and this has been developed uh, in a group of Anuana Swami at MIT. Um, and so uh, this model, it's uh, pretty much three rigid links. These links behave symmetrically, and there is a dihedral angle eta uh, here that corresponds to a flexible degree of freedom. 
And a nice feature of this model that you can write down equations of motion, at least longitudinal equations of motion, uh, down uh, pretty much uh, in terms of this uh, five equations. Everything is explicit, uh, including all the non-linearities. These are equations for uh, speed, uh, angle of attack, pitch angle, pitch rate, and then uh, eta, which is this dihedral angle. And then you can try to uh, implement this type of a maneuver low deviation uh, uh, solution. And we've, we've, uh, we've uh, uh, looked at it, uh, uh, and uh, indeed, you could uh, change uh, the flight pass angle a command. Uh, instead of a step, you change it to a ramp. And this happens automatically due to reference governor logic. And then you satisfy constraints, uh, for example, on the hydro angle, so you make sure that the deflections are not, are not too large. So all of this uh, can, can, be, uh, can be done. Um, and then uh, you start slowly uh, looking at some of the challenges uh, that uh, this, uh, the systems ha- uh, have and perhaps might uh, think about, well, how to extend some of the tools um, that, that, uh, that you have to, to address, in this particular case, high-order high order models. And so the challenge was how can one design uh, reference governors on reduced order models while they should be able to enforce the uh, constraints in uh, in higher high order high order systems, and it turns out that that uh, can also be done because uh, um, you could uh, think about reduced order model as the model where you omitted some of the states, typically states with faster dynamics, and these faster states are excited by changes in the reference command, right? And so if you slow down the reference command. Uh, then you're not going to excite those uh, states. And so you could prescribe bounds for where you want to keep the deviations of a fast states and always make sure that uh, you are limiting your reference command in such a way that uh, these excursions don't cause constraint violations. So this is the idea of this reduced order reference governor. Um, and um, you could actually do this on... Uh, um, models with many states or even with models with an infinite number of states. You could look at systems that are represented by partial differential equations, something like a, we made a flexible free-free beam uh, model that can also change the vertical uh, height and um, vertical altitude of the center of mass. This was motivated by very flexible aircraft applications. Um, and even though that system has an infinite number of elastic modes, you could sort of account for the contributions of these modes. They happen to be an infinite sum, but that's okay. The sums are convergent. Um, and so uh, you could uh, design a reference governor that's able to uh, modify the um, uh, command uh, in, su- in such a way as uh, constraints, for example, on the tip deflection of this, uh, of this beam are held uh, within the prescribed, uh, prescribed range. So you can do that. Um, but uh, we actually got uh, a nice chance to play uh, um, with uh, some of these ideas in significantly more depth at a point when uh, there was a center, a bus, University of Michigan Center for air server elasticity of very flexible aircraft uh, was created. It was in uh, uh, June of uh, 2017. Uh, and that uh, our center was led by... Uh, uh, by Professor Cesnik, and that allowed us to really look at these problems in a more comprehensive and multidisciplinary um, uh, way uh, with a significantly higher degree of realism that, that, uh, that, that, that you normally have. And this is an article about the center. There are several others uh, that, that you can find on, uh, on the internet. So the first uh, challenge, and it's a really cross-disciplinary challenge, is how to find or how to um, define a process that allows you to derive uh, good processes for good models for control. Uh, and uh, in principle, the models of continuum systems are infinite dimensionals. Uh, the tools, uh, things like finite elements, uh, they usually produce finite dimensional models. But the challenge is that these models are, are very um, high order. So if you look at the model order as one representation of complexity of the model, versus accuracy of predictive ability. For control, uh, you tend to have lower order models because this is what your tools are able to handle. Your accuracy tends to be lower, but that's why we use feedback and control. So the way we 
accommodate uncertainty in the models uh, is, is by relying on, on, on feedback. Uh, now, you design the airframe, uh, you design the aircraft, then your ability to predict the behavior uh, has, to be, has to be much, uh, much better, but the complexity of the model is, is higher. Now, very fortunately, and I'll say a few words about uh, that, we did have some of the predictive modeling uh, tools available to us, in particular something called UMNAST. I'll say a few words about this in a second. But the challenge was really what, uh, how to obtain the models that we can use for, for control. Uh, so high-order flexible aircraft models that we can derive in, from something like UMNAST would have uh, potentially thousands of states. Uh, we need something that has uh, less than 50 states uh, for control, uh, and then for comparison, when you worry about rigid aircraft, both longitudinal lateral flight, we typically have something in the order of 12 states, uh, but clearly that's not going to capture flexibility. So how do you go about addressing this problem? Well, there's a couple of things that you can do. One is that you can start with the high order models and you can use model order reduction uh, to arrive uh, at uh, some of these uh, uh, lower order flexible aircraft models. And we call this uh, process as top to bottom. Uh, now, it turns out that model order reduction methods uh, that are systematically applicable work well for linear systems. There, are, there is extensive uh, number of model order reduction techniques also for nonlinear systems, but they are harder to, 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 to use in uh, this uh, setting. Um, and uh, when you Follow this process, you typically end up with linear parameter varying models. You could also end up with nonlinear models as well uh, following this uh, step. The other um, approach is what's called bottom to top, where you start with rigid aircraft model and you try to think how to extend it with a few states that represent um, elastic, uh, elastic dynamics. Uh, and um, the idea would be to uh, uh, use for example, something like assumed mode method where you um, introduce uh, several flexible modes. Um, you define uh, dynamics, uh, for example, following Lagrange's equations of approach. And then there is various coefficients uh, that uh, emerge in forces and moments, representations of those equations that you have to fit. And this is where um, having some of these predictive models is very useful because you can actually fit the representations within these models is, uh, is um, uh, in various ways. Uh, so a little bit uh, about this very nice tool that we have at Michigan developed in uh, Professor Cessnick's uh, group. Uh, uh, so this is called University of Michigan Nonlinear Air Elastic Simulation Toolbox. Uh, and essentially it represents uh, aerodynamics, steady or unsteady, nonlinear structural dynamics. So you could uh, look at large uh, geometric uh, def deflections. It's based on um, a beam uh, beam elements, so it's, uh, it's, uh, you represent the structure as composed of uh, beam, beam elements here, uh, and then uh, nonlinear rigid body uh, dynamics. And uh, uh, there is more information about uh, this in the papers as well as uh, on, the, on the website of um, our professor. Just a quick idea how equations might, might look like. Uh, not necessarily surprises, no surprises here. This, this would be sort of a rigid body part of the equations where you use quaternions for, for the attitude uh, and then uh, for, uh, you, you, you have a, a three-dimensional vector position coordinates and then a lot of the complexity is hidden in the uh, um, uh, elastic part of the equations uh, where Q is the is, uh, uh, vector of uh, 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 strains in this particular case. So this, uh, this model is a strain-based uh, uh, model. Now, uh, what do we do in terms of um, uh, the um, uh, uh, model, uh, uh, model order reduction and coming up with models for control? Well, we might start with um, a model in UMNAST. Uh, and then uh, one... Uh, process that is very well defined is to find an equilibrium of that model, the trim point, uh, for example, corresponding to some altitude in Mach, uh, and then derive a linearized model. Derive a linearized model. This would be a model that would have thousands of states. Uh, to that model, you can apply model order reduction methods. For example, you can use something called balanced truncation, and that works reasonably well, even if the model order is quite high. 
Now, the trouble is that the basis, so when you reduce this order, you end up, um, states end up to be non-physical, and so they represent the uh, dynamics in a certain basis. Uh, the trouble is that uh, when you do it at different operating points, at different prime conditions, this basis is different. So then there is a second uh, part where you need to glue these models together in a single one, which is, and we've done, uh, we've developed certain procedures to do that. Um, out of this process, you can end up with a linear parameter varying model, or you could actually end up with a, a nonlinear uh, model if you if you interpolate uh, nonlinearly some of some some of the pieces, and so then you could uh, you could uh, sort of compare uh, the uh, prediction ability of uh, uh, some of these reduced order interpolated models uh, in terms of, for example, predicting left and right uh, uh, wing curvature at, uh, at the root as well as uh, as uh, um, translational and uh, rotational uh, rotational variables. Uh, now, the other approach is uh, to, to deriving these models is what we call bottom-to-top modeling, uh, where we start with a physical structure of the dynamics. Uh, eta here, it's a vector of model coordinates, but it's, uh, we use only a few, uh, few coordinates. Uh, and then we, what we try to do is to try to understand uh, what we need to uh, complete uh, this model. Uh, for example, uh, um, uh, there may be certain functions that we need to train that represents aerodynamic forces and moments. And we use uh, data and representations that are available in UMNAST uh, to basically we develop surrogate models for them to, uh, to, to complement this model. And we end up uh, with models that run uh, faster. They are, they are reduced order. Uh, and uh, we have been uh, uh, successful in using some of these models, for example, for nonlinear model predictive control that I'll mention a little bit later. Uh, now, let me talk about uh, uh, control. Uh, and uh, first of all, how is the maneuver load elevation done uh, uh, conventionally? Uh, so usually there is a logic that activates uh, the um, uh, maneuver load elevation, uh, you have a certain parameter which is monitored. Uh, for example, it could be vertical load factor or curvature. Uh, and um, before that parameter exceeds the threshold, there is no action of cont- by control effectors. Uh, when the exceedance happens, uh, you end up deflecting, for example, ailerons. Um, and in conventional schemes, ailerons are used as main control effectors to perform uh, MLA. So you pretty much start reacting uh, when uh, this exceedance uh, happens. Now, um, we are dealing with aircraft that have more complex dynamics that are in some sense slower. And so we need to be a bit more predictive. So just being reactive, it's going to be either too conservative or we may end up to be too late. Um, and so some of the methods that we end up um, looking at are along the lines of model predictive control um, that uh, I already spoke in the previous, uh, previous lectures. But just to give you um, an idea, uh, the way we think about model predictive control, it's a model-based feedback law. And it's defined by solving an optimization problem online on board of, uh, of the aircraft. So we're actually solving a trajectory optimization problem on board of the aircraft in real time. Uh, so model is used for prediction. And then we optimize the predicted uh, response. We apply the initial portion of this trajectory. And then we repeat this process. We measure uh, the states of our aircraft. We estimate the states of our aircraft move the prediction horizon window forward and repeat this, uh, this process. Now, the nice aspect of uh, this approach is that you can impose constraints on whatever variables you care about and uh, make sure that this optimization of uh, the trajectory also satis- this optimized trajectory also satisfies constraints. And that's, that's what we care about in these applications. Uh, as I already suggested, one way to think about model predictive control is 
as playing the game of chess, you optimize a sequence of moves into the future over uh, some horizon. And uh, um, optimizing over future horizon typically gives a better strategy in chess. Uh, the best current control action depends on what I plan to do later. Uh, and then when new measurements are available in case of chess, uh, uh, the opponent might move in a different way, for example, than you thought might, uh, might, might do it. Uh, then uh, control actions need to be updated uh, um, to, to, take, to take this unforeseen uh, issues into, into account. And then uh, in terms of equations, uh, we typically have a cost function that we define in a way suitable for a particular application that we minimize. Uh, this is in discrete time, so we think about uh, control move sequences. We have our equations of motion. This is our control-oriented model which uh, has to be satisfied on predicted state and control trajectories. And then whatever constraints we have, we impose them as a part of this formulation. And the first move of, uh, from the solution of this problem, we use for control. So our feedback move is defined, our feedback law is defined algorithmically by the first move of uh, solving this optimization problem online. That's what we do. And uh, the... Uh, um, the way we uh, rationalize such an approach is it allows us to think further ahead, predict potential issues, predict violations of constraints, rather than react to them. And then we are able to exploit entire flight envelope, so to be less conservative with, with such, uh, such an approach. So that's the motivation. Um, now, in many of, of case, of case studies we have done, uh, we tend to limit uh, the curvature, uh, for example, curvature at uh, uh, the wing root. Uh, and this is, of course, correlated to uh, uh, things like a bending moment and so on and so forth. So this is just, uh, just uh, to, to, to indicate that um, you can impose constraints on, on a curvature, and then this will translate into enforcing constraints on uh, things like bending moment. Uh, some of the work that we have done uh, was to understand what we need to sense and what we can estimate based on the models. Um, when you deploy model predictive controllers, uh, you need the current state, right, from which you predict into the future. And so uh, uh, many things that you can, you, you, you can, uh, you can measure uh, by uh, IMUs, for example, uh, uh, you know, accelerations, uh, angular uh, rates, uh, early angles, uh, but other things uh, like internal loads you have, to, you have to estimate. There are certain sensing technologies that are available, uh, but, uh, but uh, for various reasons, uh, they may not be practical or economical. Uh, we've done some research of more extensive uh, sensor sets, uh, for example, um, uh, in addition to IMUs uh, using... Uh, a camera measurement, sort of low bandwidth camera measurements, and I apologize that uh, the images uh, don't don't come across very clearly here. Uh, but uh, the idea is to uh, fuse uh, some of this uh, optical uh, camera measurements together with uh, uh, conventional measurements to provide an improved way of uh, estimating of what happens, for example, to to the wing. But the details are in some of the publications, and so if you're interested, I'd be happy to um, to point to that. So, uh, so I talked about model predictive control. I talked about reference governor, and actually, the solution uh, that we uh, we decided to pursue it's a hybrid between those two, and this is what we call maneuver load alleviation uh, MLA uh, uh, governor. It is based on MPC, but it uses uh, in part, significant part reference governor philosophy. So what we do is that we put a unit here that modifies uh, commands to the nominal uh, um, uh, flight control uh, system. And then at the same time, it has a capability to directly drive actuators that are dedicated to the uh, maneuver load uh, alleviation system. And so uh, one configuration you could, uh, you could potentially consider is, is this, where you might have uh, outer ailerons, which would be actuators dedicated to MLA. And so you directly uh, control them. 
uh, and then uh, if you want to modify the maneuver a little bit, uh, you could uh, feed in uh, into uh, nominal FCS, a flight control system, uh, modified commands. Uh, and for example, you could uh, modify commands for uh, the velocity, for flight pass angle, for side slip angle, and heading angle. Uh, the outer ailerons could be used for MLA directly, and then uh, the nominal controller might control other actuators, thrust, in the ailerons, elevators, rather. And uh, you sort of tend to gang up actuators. For example, you assume that elevators deflect symmetrically, in the ailerons deflect asymmetrically, and thrust is, is symmetric on, on both wings. Uh, now, uh, in terms of the cost function that uh, you might... Uh, uh, minimize in this hybrid uh, MBC reference governor approach, uh, you tend to uh, minimize the deviation of modified uh, commands from uh, what you desire. Uh, you also modify rate of change, uh, penalize rate of change, uh, and then you uh, penalize in the cost the, um, this may be a little bit more clearer, penalize uh, also in the cost the uh, uh, time rate of change of uh, actuation signals to MLA actuators, as well as their absolute values. Because ideally, you'd like uh, the absolute uh, deviation of control effectors to be used for MLA to be zero. You don't want to, you don't want to use them, as well as you don't want to have a lot of modifications in the command. Uh, you impose constraints as a part of this formulation. Here, we're using uh, linear models uh, as a part of um, uh, prediction, uh, prediction uh, uh, dynamics, but you could uh, use uh, nonlinear models as well at the price of a significantly uh, harder, uh, harder uh, optimization problem that you need to solve. So challenge, of course, is real-time implementation. Um, and uh, generally speaking, the computation time is related to things like number of decision variables, which is related to prediction horizon and how far ahead you have to look. Uh, number of constraints that you have uh, in, a, in a problem uh, and uh, uh, number of states in the model as well. And computation time would also depend on solver, solver performance. So we have to do quite a bit of work to simplify the problem so we're able to do the computations in reasonable time. And uh, uh, we do something called uh, move blocking that is... Um, um, uh, essentially allows us to uh, uh, combine several control moves over the prediction horizon to a single, uh, single move. Uh, critical station identification. So constraints actually are imposed at multiple stations within the aircraft structure on the fuselage, at the wings, and at the tail. In fact, uh, the tail and uh, wing, uh, they end up to be quite, uh, quite coupled in reality. Uh, what we tend to do is that to reduce the number of constraints, we tend to identify critical stations such that if we satisfy constraints at these stations, then constraints will be satisfied elsewhere. So this is a reasonable approach to try to uh, reduce uh, the number of constraints. Now, the other uh, method that we found very useful is constraint aggregation uh, using uh, KS uh, functions. And I'll show a little bit more, uh, uh, say, say a few more things about KS functions on the uh, uh, next slide. Uh, but they have interesting history in a sense that that's something that um, appeared originally in robust control. So it actually appeared in uh, a control uh, theory. And then uh, control people, they forgot about it. And multidisciplinary design optimization, people picked it up. It's a standard technique in uh, multidisciplinary design optimization. Um, and so... We've been trying to actually bring these techniques back into, into control for, for, for model predictive control. And then uh, we do various numerical strategies where we don't look for exact uh, solution of the optimization problem. So we use, we use an inexact solution and we warm start the solver from the previous time step. And we figure out what quality of inexactness is, is sufficient for us to, to, to be able to do what we want to do. Uh, so uh, with some of these uh, uh, strategies, we're able to get a significant reduction in uh, uh, computational uh, 
uh, time, um, in particular, the, the chaos uh, uh, constraint aggregation gives up, can give us up to 90% reduction in computational time. Um, and then these are some of the simulation results, which pretty much show that we're able to uh, satisfy uh, constraints on uh, uh, curvature of the, at the wing root, uh, uh, as well as, as, as other constraints with this maneuver load elevation governor. Now, a little bit about this uh, chaos functions. Uh, let me just give, give you kind of an idea. So whenever you have a problem that you want to minimize a function, this is a general optimization subject to uh, many constraints. Uh, what you can do is that you can try to aggregate these constraints into a single constraint. So you want to minimize this function f subject to a single constraint being less than or equal than zero. Now, the, the obvious constraint is just take a maximum, right, of this and say that if the maximum less than or equal than zero, then that's a single constraint. The problem is the maximum, it's non smooth. So chaos functions allow you to have a smooth approximation. So when you use chaos functions, they look something like this. Um, and they allow a smooth uh, approximation so you can use them together with gradient-based uh, uh, base solvers. Now, initially, when we discussed this idea, it was not um, apparent that this would actually provide an improvement because if my model predictive control is based on linear models and my constraints are linear, then by transitioning to this chaos functions, what I'm basically doing is that I'm coming up with single constraint, but that constraint is not linear. So all of a sudden, instead of solving quadratic program online, I have to solve a nonlinear problem online, and we use sequential quadratic programming for that. But interestingly enough, uh, uh, that uh, that all, that strategy has shown very significant reduction in the, in the computation time, and so we decided to adopt it. And in some of our papers, we also analyze uh, um, what happens with in terms of closed loop uh, properties when you use this type of uh, uh, aggregation. Uh, you could also use this idea in a nonlinear model predictive control. In fact, uh, uh, the idea of nonlinear model predictive control is that we use uh, not linearized or linear parameter varying models, but directly nonlinear models that come from the bottom to top approach. Uh, and then here we're able to use chaos aggregation, sequential quadratic programming algorithm uh, in conjunction with different QP solvers. In all of these uh, cases, we're able to see nice reduction in computational time that, that we obtain with this uh, chaos uh, uh, function based approximation, as well as ability to, to do things that we want to do. Um, what are some other aspects of this problem we looked at? Uh, well, uh, what happens if uh, some of the model parameters are uh, unknown? And in the case of aircraft, the load elevation system must be effective in different uh, mass configuration scenarios of, of, of the aircraft. Um, and so what's interesting is that the mass uh, configuration uh, uh, it's not something that uh, is, um, uh, well, you're allowed to estimate, so you have to treat it as unknown. And for this type of uh, situations, uh, we do scenario-based uh, optimization where we pretty much sample parameter space. We pick a few samples, uh, and then we are trying to enforce the constraints uh, for, uh, this, uh, uh, for, this, uh, for the samples. Uh, now, of course, uh, uh, the computational complexity of this grows, and we um, develop various time distri distributed strategies where we uh, check constraints for some of the samples at current time steps, and then at the next time step, we pick a few other samples and so on and so forth. So there's various ways to do what we call time distributed scenario-based uh, model predictive control that allows us to handle constraints, but then... Um, it's a little bit less computational demanding. Um, a lot of things I spoke about so far was about uh, uh, MLA governor, manu maneuver load elevation governor. What about gas load elevation? Uh, um, um, so you could uh, extend uh, uh, the approach uh, to, uh, um, to also gas load elevation. Uh, and so you can have a combined MLA-GLA system. In a current aircraft, uh, these two systems are actually separate. Um, when, uh, when, you, when, you take, when, when you fly an airplane, 
uh, typically you get hit by the first gust, right? There is a aircraft is shaking, and then somehow everything uh, disappears because GLA system becomes active. Um, so the trouble is how to um, avoid this first kind of effects of the first gust uh, hit. And here, a very promising solution is to use a preview and to use something like a LIDAR to be able to estimate um, the uh, gust velocity. Uh, and then uh, the nice uh, feature of model predictive control is that if you have a disturbance and you have a preview, you have a forecast of the disturbance, it's very easy to integrate that preview into the optimization problem and have a solution that actually accounts for that, uh, for that preview. Uh, and that can be done, and uh, 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 some of the simulation results are here that um, Matthias Pereira developed in his dissertation. Uh, they show that, uh, that uh, you could um, speed up the deployment of uh, control surfaces um, as soon as future constraint violation is detected and um, be more successful in, uh, um, in being able to satisfy the constraints than you could be if, uh, if you don't have this, uh, this ability to do the, the preview. Um, we have uh, progressed uh, to uh, uh, the level of uh, testing. Uh, some of these solutions uh, in a wind tunnel that work is still uh, ongoing, but uh, let's just show some videos uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a wind tunnel. We were hoping to uh, apply some of the solutions as well. Uh, but uh, this uh, COVID in between, in the middle of this project, uh, doing flight testing uh, has been uh, quite uh, quite challenging. But this is basically what this shows, is that we, uh, we command the pitch to, to half of the aircraft here. And in a wind tunnel, we have both uh, the wing and tail replicated, because it turns out there is uh, interactions. Uh, you can alleviate loads on the wing, but then the tail is going to suffer. So those, those dynamics are kind of coupled, and we found that we have to actually do, do both. Um, again, this work uh, is, is continuing, but these are some of the um, some of current videos that we have. Um, um, uh, very briefly um, about a couple of other uh, uh, solutions as we were exploiting this uh, different approaches to uh, achieving MLA, GLA. Um, what I showed was to use this governor architecture. Um, uh, the other approach we tried to explore was to um, look at the traditional control allocation. If you think about aircraft flight control, typically you have a flight control law, uh, and then you have a control allocation layer that decides on how to allocate uh, forces and moments uh, to uh, control effects that, that you have. Often you have this, uh, this partitioning. Uh, so we spent time thinking about uh, how we could... Um, create a system that allocates um, um, uh, the, the, the control uh, signals in such a way that, uh, that uh, uh, some signals only affect the rigid body motion and others only affect uh, the uh, flexible motion. Um, and it um, um, turns out that uh, you have certain redundant properties. You have many actuators in the system. And so there's a notion of what we call weak input redundancy and you can uh, establish sort of a null space where you have an auxiliary control variable. And if you manipulate this auxiliary control variable, it only affects flexible output. Uh, it doesn't affect the rigid body uh, uh, motion. Uh, and so then this, is, this auxiliary control variable can be modified to be able to reduce the loads. Um, uh, so this is something that we've, uh, we've, we've looked at. Um, and uh, um, the other area that I want to point out just with one slide, this is a huge area, is really what does it mean to have a maneuver load elevation system or gas load elevation system from the design perspective? Could you design your aircraft differently? Uh, and this speaks to uh, sort of multidiscipline design optimization, which is control aware, aware of the fact that uh, you have an active MLA system um, uh, on, on, uh, on board, for example. And we've been doing some, some work in this area. I'm not going to say much about it, um, but if this is an area of interest, I could uh, probably send some papers. This actually brings me to a closure, to a conclusion of my talk. Uh, 
with a few uh, final uh, thoughts. Um, so the first one is that uh, uh, the general trend in terms of commercial aircraft and also in some of the uh, more interesting uh, aerial platforms is towards uh, higher aspect ratio wings, uh, reduced fuel consumption, increased endurance. Um, and so um, the issues of uh, uh, how to deal with increasing aircraft flexibility are here to stay. Uh, the dynamics, hopefully, um, from what I discussed, is fairly clear that the, the, the dynamics are quite interesting. It's a great playground if one is interested in dynamics and modeling in, in control. But dynamics are nonlinear, complex. Uh, physics based models are high order. Um, uh, one approach to address load elevation requirements that we pursued is by imposing constraints. Uh, Model predictive control solutions and reference governance solutions, they provide capability to act on predicted constraint violations. The, um, I talked about um, um, the uh, MPC-based maneuver load elevation governor architecture, which is a hybrid between reference governors and conventional MPC solutions. Um, I think uh, that uh, the other important uh, point I want to make is that uh, if you look at this control problems for increasingly flexible aircraft, it's really exciting across this frontier. And you need to know something about control, flight mechanics, but also air elasticity. And you really need to know enough about each of these areas to be able to make uh, good progress. But it also means that there are many opportunities for continuing research. Uh, and uh, in my last slide, I touched upon various aspects of coupling between aircraft design and control. Um, and uh, they're becoming of uh, more and more interest, uh, as, as of course they, they should be. Uh, so uh, it has been my true pleasure to uh, to give some of these uh, remarks uh, to you, and uh, thank you very much for attending the talk. I'm happy to uh, answer any questions.